Hi, welcome to a lecture on rectangular patch antennas. This is part one of a multi-part lecture. In this part, I'll be addressing analysis, in particular, general principles of operation, polarization, and pattern. In part two, I'll address design, including issues of impedance, bandwidth, and a few other important matters. In this presentation, I will limit scope to rectangular patch antennas which are half-wave resonant and linearly polarized. Although there are other possibilities, this will give us plenty to talk about. In particular, I will give you a general idea of how patch antennas operate, and then I'll explain the characteristics of the electric field radiated by a rectangular patch antenna, including pattern and polarization. Before beginning, let me acknowledge two references, and these references are the two most popular general antenna textbooks, namely Stutzman and Thiel, Antenna Theory and Design, and Bellanus, Antenna Theory. Most of what appears here can also be found in those references. I suggest going to these references as well as to the references cited by these books for a deeper dive on this topic. But let me warn you that patch antennas are relatively complicated, and there are lots of ways to try to grapple with that complexity. You're going to find that different authors have different ways of peeling this onion and that those different ways are not always entirely consistent with each other. This can get really confusing even for students who already know something about antennas. What I've tried to do here is to stick to the high-level concepts and results that I think everyone agrees on and try to avoid getting bogged down in extraneous detail. Here's a picture of what we're talking about. The antenna consists of a rectangular patch implemented on a printed circuit board. The printed circuit board consists of a top layer, in this case including the patch, a dielectric substrate, and a ground plane. In this lecture, the details of the substrate are not so important. What is important to know at this point is that the substrate thickness, indicated by the variable t here, be tiny relative to a wavelength. We will feed the antenna using a microstrip transmission line connected to the center of one side of the patch. Thus, the patch is essentially an extension of the transmission line. The dimension indicated here is capital L is the length of this extension, and the dimension indicated by capital W here is the width of this extension. As you might have guessed, the trick is to choose L and W so that the patch radiates power arriving from the transmission line, as opposed to reflecting this power back into the transmission line. The trick here will be to make L about one half wavelength. Specifically, we'll choose the particular value of L that's closest to one half wavelength at which the patch is resonant. And by resonant, we mean that the imaginary part of the impedance of the antenna is zero. At resonance, there is no stored energy, so the power is either reflected or radiated. If the characteristic impedance of the transmission line is matched to the real part of the impedance of the antenna, then the power can only be radiated, and that's of course what we want. We can control the real part of the impedance using the width, that is W. When the patch is half-wave resonant and edge-fed, as shown here, the radiation from the patch will be linearly polarized. Well, for the most part. More on that later. Before getting too far into this, let's address why you might or might not want to use a patch antenna. A big plus for this type of antenna is that it's easy to implement on a printed circuit board. That makes it inexpensive and easy to integrate into systems that consist of electronics that are probably also implemented on a printed circuit board. Furthermore, this type of antenna is flat, which is a convenient shape, and furthermore, you can put things on the other side of the ground plane without worrying too much about those things interfering with the behavior of the antenna. A not-so-great thing about patch antennas of this type is that they have tiny bandwidth, typically just 1 to 3 percent. That's pretty bad compared even to simple wire dipoles, which typically yield between 3 and 10 percent. Also, it turns out that the radiation efficiency of patches is usually not great. 
and that's due to a number of factors, including loss in the dielectric and the tendency for some fraction of the power to be trapped in a wave which propagates in the substrate. Okay, so here's what's going on. As I mentioned before, the patch behaves like an extension of the transmission line that is about one half wavelength long and terminates in an open circuit. Since the current at an open circuit is zero, the voltage is maximum and therefore the electric field is maximum. Now, if you back up one half wavelength to the beginning of the patch, you expect the electric field to again be maximum, but now pointing in the opposite direction. The electric field in the dielectric between those two ends decreases to zero and then increases with the opposite sign. However, none of that will be important. All that is important for now is that we recognize maximum electric field intensity at the two ends and that the direction of the electric field is opposite at the two ends. Note also that none of this so far accounts for the radiation of the power away from the patch. All we've done so far is to recognize something about the structure of the fields directly underneath the patch. The radiation from a patch comes primarily from fringing fields at the ends of the patch. The fringing fields exist because electromagnetic boundary conditions are in effect. That is, without a discontinuity in the dielectric, the electric field itself must extend beyond the patch and subsequently into the space above the dielectric. Note that the direction of the fringing component of the electric field directly above the right edge of the patch is directed to the right. Note also that the direction of the fringing component of the electric field directly above the left edge is also directed to the right. Radiation associated with those particular components of the fringing field, that is, the components I've circled here in orange, are what account for the radiation. And this radiation propagates towards the top of the screen because it's in phase when it travels in that direction. All other components tend to cancel because they are not similarly aligned. Thus, radiation appears to originate from the near and far edges of the patch and not the sides or the top. At this point, it becomes awkward to think of radiation as being a continuation of the electric fields. So what we're going to do is switch to equivalent currents, which are shown here as orange arrows. Specifically, the orange arrows represent electric currents which, in the absence of the patch and in the absence of a ground screen, that is in free space, result in the field radiated by the co-aligned component of the fringing field identified in the previous slide. So, let's be clear. In the actual situation, there are no such currents. All we are doing here is answering the question, what electric currents in free space radiate the same fields as the radiating component of the fringing fields in the patch? And, those electric currents are the orange arrows shown here. Note the direction of these currents is to the left whereas the direction of the fringing fields that they replaced is to the right. This is because the reference direction for the electric field radiated by a current moment is generally opposite the direction of current flow. For a reminder about all that, see any good discussion of the fields radiated by an electrically short dipole, and you'll see what I mean. So, now, when the smoke clears, we have a model consisting of electric currents in free space, which are organized into two lines of length W, and those two lines are separated by distance L. And, before moving on, let's be honest with ourselves and note that we've made a lot of approximations here. For example, we've ignored the presence of the transmission line that's feeding this patch, and also we've ignored any component of the fringing fields which is not perfectly aligned, as shown here. Nevertheless, as crude as this is, we can do some pretty useful things with this model, and the results can be confirmed by more careful modeling and or measurements, both of which, of course, are beyond the scope of this lecture. Note that we are now able to see that this antenna will produce radiation, which is primarily linearly polarized. To see this, simply note that the current is pointing in the same direction, and further, Note that all the current is confined to an area, that is, 
the area of the patch, which is roughly a half wavelength across. So for the purpose of assessing polarization, you can approximate all this current as being a single current moment at the origin. And current moments radiate linear polarization. So therefore, so does this patch, at least approximately. Also, we are now just about ready to talk about pattern. For this, a global coordinate system is useful. Here, a global Cartesian coordinate system has been established with X corresponding to the L or length axis, Y corresponding to the W or width axis, and Z perpendicular to the patch, which will be the primary direction of radiation. For reference, the inset on the right shows the definitions of the spherical coordinates theta and phi in this particular coordinate system. Finally, note that we can now identify the E and H planes for this antenna. The E plane is the Y equals zero plane, that is when phi is either zero or pi. And H is the X equals zero plane, that is phi equals plus or minus pi over two. Knowledge of this current distribution is sufficient to derive an expression for the radiated electric field. To do this, Note simply that the total radiated field is the sum of the fields radiated by the current moments comprising the equivalent currents. I will not do the derivation here, but it does appear in the references that I've mentioned. Without further ado, here is the expression for the radiation in the far field. We have four factors. E0 is simply a catch-all constant coefficient for everything which does not vary with the coordinates of the field point. Next, we have a vector which corresponds to the polarization of the field. Third, we have a factor f theta phi, which together with the preceding factor describes the pattern, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Finally, we have the expected spherical wave dependence, that is, what we expect for radiation in the far field. Note carefully that the electric field in this model is zero below the ground plane. So we get this expression above the ground plane and zero below the ground plane. Here's that factor f theta phi. The first factor is simply the sine argument over argument form, uh, also known as sinc, uh, that we expect to get from a single line source of width w. The second factor is the array factor. And this accounts for the fact that we have not one of these line sources, but two. And those two line sources are separated by a distance L. Worth noting here is that the first factor is actually very similar to cosine theta. That is, because the argument in the numerator and the denominator of this sink-like function is generally pretty small, we're typically always in the central lobe of the sink type function, and uh, that looks a lot like cosine. So, since both factors are approximately cosine theta, and I mean very approximately, you can infer correctly that the overall pattern will be similar to cosine theta. And we'll see that's true. As is our usual practice, we'll see what this reduces to with the E and the H planes. This is the result, that is the normalized pattern function, for the E plane. Now, coming up with this is quite simple to do, and I recommend you do this for yourself as a way to know or to be sure you know what's going on. In any event, we see that the result, when the smoke clears, is plus or minus theta hat for the polarization and the, a cosine function here for magnitude. The plus sign corresponds to phi equals zero and the minus sign corresponds to phi equals pi. And you'll see why that happens and why it's necessary in the next slide. Here's the result from the previous slide displayed graphically. On the left is the magnitude. We see it's cosine-like, with the principal difference being that it does not go to zero for theta equals pi over two. In other words, it doesn't go to zero in the plane of the ground plane. On the right is the polarization. Now, this is the expected result. And again, to see this, just consider what it should be for a single current moment at the origin, which essentially produces the same polarization as I argued earlier. Also, we now see what that minus theta hat business is about, 
It's simply making the vector point in the correct direction on both sides of the x equals zero plane. Here's a normalized function for the h plane. Again, this is quite simple to work out, and I recommend you do this yourself as a way to make sure you know what's going on. Here we see that the result is x hat polarized, x hat everywhere in the h plane, and that the magnitude is a sinc function times cosine theta. And here's that result displayed graphically. On the left is the magnitude. Again, we see it as cosine like, but in this case it does go to zero for theta equals pi over two. It does go to zero in the plane of the ground plane. On the right, again, we see the polarization, all x hat directed, and again, this is the expected result. So, to wrap up, this lecture has been an introduction to rectangular patch antennas, which are half-wave resonant and fed so that they are linearly polarized. As I noted at the beginning of this lecture, there are alternatives to half-wave resonance, and there are alternative feed schemes, which do not necessarily yield linear polarization, so be careful. We found that the radiation from this class of antennas is primarily due to fringing fields, and that the radiation can be modeled as that from two lines of current, having length w separated by distance l, radiating in free space. At least that tells us something about the patterns. By the way, let me address advanced students for just a moment. Advanced students may recognize that each one of those line currents looks like what you would get for a rectangular slot in a ground plane. And that's totally true. In fact, it's often convenient to replace those electric currents in the patch model with magnetic currents, as you normally would for the analysis of a slot antenna. So, there's some kinship between rectangular patch antennas and these pairs of slot antennas. And that can occasionally be useful to know about. Anyway, we've noted that the pattern of this class of antennas is similar to cosine theta above the ground plane, and the pattern should be exactly zero below the ground plane. And of course, these assumptions depend on the ground plane being infinite. So, you can expect some additional malarkey if the ground plane is finite. Finally, we observe that this class of antennas yields linear polarization in the E and the H planes. And, again, we recognize that a number of factors will conspire to mess this up outside of the E and the H planes, and in fact also in directions far from the z-axis. Nevertheless, we refer to the polarization of these antennas as being generally linear, or primarily linear. And this concludes part one. In part two, we'll address design procedures, impedance, radiation efficiency, and a number of other practical considerations.